All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Dusty. I'm one of the pastors here. And I just want to interact with that video just for a moment. Um, uh, first of all, Lauren's the coolest. She's probably in the service, I think. And just love her to death anyways. But we're, uh, we are in uh, the, the beginning stages of something called All In. And um, one of the things that excites me, yes, we want to do things in our city, but that's actually not the part that excites me the most. The part that excites me the most is the heart behind what you heard in that video from Lauren, uh, which is that when you begin to, we begin to wrestle with questions about money and generosity and look, I, I want to be all in with the Lord, even in this area, that it necessarily begins to connect other areas. Like it really, it, it kind of calls the question of allegiance and trust. And it's not just with Lauren. I, like the other day, uh, we had a men's breakfast and had another one of our members that just came up to me unsolicited and said, hey, I wasn't so sure about all in and all that, but then um, that I just need to tell, um, tell you what God's been doing in, in me. Like it's like as we began to wrestle with this question, it started to hit on this and this and this and this, and it did how fruitful um, that, um, that that had been in his life. And I think he's in the service too. So um, you just begin to see how this begins to touch us. And I get so excited to think about uh, just this, this discipleship of becoming like Jesus, trusting Jesus, all in for Jesus. I um, mean, you could hear that in, in Lauren, and I love that. So um, we are uh, going through the book of Hebrews and what a journey it's been. Uh, so we are uh, picking up where we left off uh, from uh, BG last week. We are in Hebrews 9. And I'm going to start in verse 11 in just a moment, but um, I did want to, because we're not touching on the first 10 verses, I wanted to give a, a, a five bullet point summary of the first 10 verses. And a lot of this is going to build on these today. So these are the things that we're not going to talk about, but we are going to talk about because it gets picked up in these verses. So um, as you read um, Hebrews 9 on your own, you'll see some of these. Jesus is the great high priest. That's been a theme we've seen over and over again in the book of Hebrews up till now. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. That's going to get developed um, in a beautiful Beautiful and more clear way today. The new covenant has come to us that is better than the old. That's going to get built on today. Uh, this new covenant makes the old covenant obsolete. That's going to get built on today. And the old covenant uh, restricted access to God. So those are, uh, those are some of the themes in the first uh, 10 verses. And now, uh, before I kind of tell you what the main, main thing we're going to explore, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into the Bible. And, and I think the scripture will highlight what our theme is going to be and even what the a question I always like to ask myself is you're like, okay, that's the theme of this passage. So what's the biggest barrier to me like believing that, acting on that? And that's what we're going to talk about. So uh, verse 11 in Hebrews chapter 9, it'll be on the screen and let's start working through it. It says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, again, that theme of high priest is picked up here. Then, uh, then through the greater and more perfect tent, that's referring to the temple, um, you know, the, temp the temp uh, temporary structure of that in the wilderness uh, when they're moving to Israel um, was the tabernacle. That's what that'd be referring to, but it's the same thing. Uh, not made by hands, that is not of this creation. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. Uh, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats um, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, so if you just picked up this chapter and verse, you just kind of flipped the Bible open or like, let's read that today. And you didn't have a lot of background in the Bible, you would read this and be like, now what? <laughs> what is going on here? Heifers and blood and goats and like, what in the world? Uh, what are we, what's even happening here? And so, but it's pulling a lot from the Old Testament and it actually makes a lot of sense from not only the first 10 verses of chapter nine, but really chapters one through eight before it, that uh, there, there's this comparison being made uh, between the Old Testament. And I'm not gonna say too much about that now in the Old Covenant and New Covenant realities. That's going to get picked up uh, more in this passage. And so much of the imagery right here relates to the Old Testament sacrificial system, specifically with the temple. Um, there, I mean, it's all over this. And the comparisons, Jesus is high priest. Well, there had to be a high priest in the temple. And then there was the temple itself. And it refers to it with a tent, but that's the same thing. That was just the, the, the portable structure while they're traveling through the wilderness. The brick and mortar permanent structure of that 
that was the temple. But it's the same thing, all the same rooms and the same design, uh, the same purpose, all of that. Um, and uh, there had to be blood and there had to be sacrifices. And in the Old Covenant, um, you had high priests that would perform those, human high priests, and then there would be bulls and goats. And yes, for sin, but also for purification. Um, that, that you would, uh, there's a couple of different categories in the Old Testament. You'd have, uh, you had sin um, that needed, you know, atonement. But you also had a, a category of cleanness where you could be ceremonially unclean and unfit to participate in any kind of temple function or even to be part, uh, part of the other people uh, for a lot of reasons. You could like touch a dead body or you could um, come in contact with uh, an unclean meat like pork or something like that. And those things would make you ceremonially unclean and you have to be cleansed. And there are these things you would do to get back in, um, even in, in, uh, from a ritual standpoint, to be considered clean. And so um, that all of that imagery, you're going to see how that's going to be imported into the new covenant, uh, except just intensified and taken to the nth degree. So um, even just as one chart, I'm going to go full Keenan Harris, another one of our pastors, and I've got a chart. That's not normally my cup of tea. Now, I'm not going to do this, but if you're, you like to take pictures or whatever, you could do that. Uh, but I just wanted you to see the correlation, new covenant, old covenant. Um, the good things that have come, verse 11, the law was a, but a shadow of, of the good things, of the things to come. And you can see um, there's a greater and more perfect tent. And then in the old covenant, you had an earthly place of holiness and so on and so forth. Um, that there are these points of comparison and contrast. And uh, the short version of all of these things is that, um, is that there was this, it was a good thing, the old covenant on the right hand column. Like if you look at that fourth one, uh, the regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. That's a good thing. Uh, that's a good thing, but it was just limited. Verse 12, we're talking eternal redemption. And so similar, but much greater. Now, the, the topic that we're going to be hitting on today is the blood of Jesus. That's going to be the topic. Um, it's the theme. It came up twice in that passage. It's going to come up throughout the rest of our time today. That's going to be our theme we're going to talk on. And, um, and so, again, as I said earlier, um, that, um, that we can have some we can have some pushback to this. So I started thinking about, like, where does our main pushback come to um, the blood of Christ exactly? Like, where does it come from? Um, and I think there is substantial, um, substantial um, um, pushback on this. Um, we're going to get to that in just a moment, uh, but I wanted to say it up front that that's where we're going to be going. Um, on this passage, um, it, it's really incredible how Jesus would, uh, you know, that, that the blood would make people ceremonially clean, but he could, um, he could purify our conscience. That's an internal work that he can do in us, not just, um, not just you know, essentially uh, make us ceremonial clean with our flesh, but he could actually make us clean and forgiven and right with God um, through his death and resurrection. And I love that last part, what it says when it says that, um, it says that um, how much more will the blood of Christ, again, there's that how much more. This did this, and that was good. Uh, but how much more in this new covenant era, um, through the eternal spirit offering himself, he was without blemish. He purifies our conscience. This is that internal work. And it says from dead works, so we're saved, we're purified from dead works, and then we're enabled to serve the living God. So I wanted to explore, this has actually come up a few weeks ago, this phrase dead works, and there's probably a couple of different meanings to it. I think one that's the most likely, but I think perhaps there's a second meaning as well. So the most likely and clearest meaning of this, and I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, is that dead works would mean the things that we do that should have resulted in our judgment um, that, um, that Jesus' death and resurrection um, are, are closed that distance and forgives us and purifies us, even though it should have led to our condemnation, that he purifies us from these dead works, things we do that are sinful that should have led to our judgment. Um, so um, that would be the wicked, sinful things that we do that Jesus says, I actually want to enter into that and I want to save you. And so let me give you an example of this that um, there's a guy named Matt Chandler. Some of you guys know him, um, that pastor in Dallas. And he had this pretty, it went viral. And it's actually one of the things that kind of made him Matt Chandler, so to speak, is, uh, is this thing that he said one time um, in his early days of ministry. And he went to this conference and he had, um, he was with, um, I think it maybe it was him and his wife and then another woman and a woman that had a lot, of, a lot of bad experiences with the church, even specifically around like how sexuality had been talked about. And it was one of these things that um, like he, the guy starts talking about sex and whatnot and they passed around a rose while, while, uh, while the guy was talking. And of course, by the time, can you can imagine if you passed a, a rose, you know, just a single rose around this room, what it would look like by the time 
time it got back here, like, like this, and petals were hanging off, and several had fallen off, and he asked for the rose back, and he's like, is this what you want to be, you know? Is this what you want to be, picked apart, all droopy? Is this what you want to give your spouse, you know? And that kind of thing, right? So you, you may have heard that kind of sermon in the past, you know? And it, it, that, that Matt was incensed at this. He, it made him really angry. He's like, no, nah, man, like, Jesus wants that rose, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this. Like, what hope do any of us have if, if it's that, that droopy rose, if Jesus is like, I'm gonna give my life for that rose. I'm gonna make you clean. And you could take that about any area you want to. You're like, well, I've, I've made a lot of relationship mistakes. You know, okay, well, that one. And what about, well, I've made a lot of financial mistakes and I've done some ugly things in my life and I've made, uh, I've, I've really ruined some relationships because of selfishness and I've done this and I've done, yeah, yeah, that. Like that, that's exactly, he came to purify you from dead works, that he came to save you internally and do a work. And if it was based on our outward performance and our outward cleanness, so to speak, none of us would be admitted. It's the whole point. He came to purify us from dead works. Now, second meaning to that could also be um, the, just the external performance of, like you think about, and it does fit the context, a lot of the Jewish folks that, um, that would be written to here, um, that there was a lot of, you know, do this and avoid this and don't eat this and do this. And if you kind of check most of the boxes, then you're good and you're kind of, in a way, at least for now. And um, and it could be that even those kind of dead works where you're just like the checklist of things, and it, that wouldn't just be for people that were raised in Judaism. I mean, that is alive and well. I, I feel like once a week I meet with someone that's newer to Redeemer that tells me their story, and they're like, yeah, I grew up in this tradition. It's very oppressive, and like there was nothing that was ever good enough, oftentimes with really mean parents um, that felt like they were probably doing God a favor by being mean, uh, like maybe even to the edge of abusive and those kind of things, and like really going hard on all that and uh, churches where it was like, you're never doing enough and you ought to do more. And if you do more, then, then maybe God will get off your back for a minute and that kind of thing. And um, that there's also this component that I think very well could fit this context of dead works, meaning like doing, uh, it doesn't mean everything we do of faith, like obedience is not ugly to God. That's not a dead work. That's a work that is flowing from faith. But like all these things trying to be on the spiritual treadmill that maybe it'll be enough that God will say it's okay. It, it would also purify us from that. Um, that also could be in view here. And so you're, you're purified, again, not from obedience. That's beautiful to God. Um, but you're purified from dead works of our performance on the religious treadmill, also from our dead works of things that we do, trying to, um, that were part of our condemnation, really, that the cross answers all of that and more um, through Jesus's death and resurrection. And now, not only are you purified, uh, but you're actually enabled to serve the living God. How incredible about that is that? So let me talk, before we move on to this passage, and we do have quite a bit more ground to cover, but I did want to talk about where I feel like the rub may be on, uh, on the blood. And I think it comes from both kind of an um, outside and an internal um, pushback. So external, like I'm talking people who aren't Christians looking outside in, will critique Christianity about the blood all the time. Like I've heard the phrase like divine child abuse before where people outside looking in will say, look, the father you know, killed his own son. I mean, that's child abuse and um, had him tortured and all these things. And how mean is that? And how, what, what crazy thing do you guys believe? Um, and, and I think this is, um, this is not a good argument at all uh, for a variety of reasons. One, it underestimates the seriousness of sin, which we'll come back to in a moment. And it also um, underestimates like who exactly would make us right with God if we have offended him and we have rejected him and we've sinned, like would one of us be a, a, the right one to die on behalf? behalf of others, even though we have plenty of blemishes, we are those roses and all those things. I mean, which one of us could be a go-between for other people? And the answer is none of us could. Um, that, that only God himself could be put forward. And so there, there's recoil to, um, to the blood. In fact, sometimes I'll have friends or people that I know that will come to Redeemer and will hear a baptism story like you're going to hear this morning in this service. And sometimes there can even be recoil to that about like, I don't like all this sin talk and blood talk and all this. It's like, why? That's gory and gross. And, and, um, and why, why do we talk about sin? And why do we need saving to begin with? It could be, it could be offensive that we even need that. Um, that. That's one part. But it's not just external where some of the pushback to the blood of Jesus can be. Sometimes it's internal among the church as well, um, where um, like the other day, please don't judge me for this. I don't know what got into me, but I was bored at one of my kids' um, 
baseball games in Dallas when he was playing. Um, and I was looking at this Facebook group, um, or Facebook guy, and he's kind of like an anti-institutional, anti-big church guy, but he's got some interesting thoughts. And um, used to be like a mega church pastor and all this. And he asked a question like, can you define gospel-centered for me? And I was like... Yeah, actually, I could, this is like up on our wall. You may have seen that, gospel-centered. And, and he's like, what do you mean by that, is what the question was. And so I just typed in there uh, real quick. Is, what I mean by that is Jesus' death and resurrection that, yes, um, forgives us, and so for salvation. But what I mean by that is that grace uh, not only saves us, but it actually enables every kind of obedience. Like, we don't just get saved by grace and then move on to, like, do good and be good people. Uh, but even any kind of obedience we do and any kind of of ongoing trust is fueled by grace all the time. That's what I mean by it. And it was interesting that um, I was thinking that like that'd be a pretty satisfying answer. Go, okay, well, if that's what you mean, okay, I can live with that. Um, that's good. But man, I kind of got pounced on. It wasn't awful. Uh, but in general, in general, but I mean, again, I don't expect sympathy from you. You're like, dude, you talked on the internet. <laughs> what are you thinking? And I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Uh, but, um, but, the, uh, but the main thing that people were saying was that we're focusing too much on Jesus' death and like the substitutionary element of that and should be focusing more on the life of Jesus. And gospel should be, be more like be like Jesus as opposed to the blood of Jesus. And I actually don't think those are on different teams, by the way. I'm just throwing that out there that um, we are called to be like Jesus. But I would also like to point this out. Um, what I have found when people tend to put a focus on um, act like Jesus, usually what they mean are the parts of Jesus that they like, you know, um, where it's like, oh, when he seems sweet and kind of like you'd like to cuddle with him and that kind of thing, um, and kind of a manicured beard and just real tender, sweet guy, and he just, he cares about people and, and says nice things and not real judgy and things like that, that that's what we tend to mean, and we tend to not mean um, the fierceness and the holiness and the call to, uh, to follow and that kind of, like we tend, to, we tend to not emphasize those parts as much. And so it's just interesting, like even, even the act like Jesus component, which I'm not against at all because we wanna obey all that he's commanded us. Jesus said, those were his last words for sure, but it's not either or here. We don't, we don't wanna distance from the blood of Jesus so we can try to uh, just check the boxes and do good things or at least the things we like about him. You know? So let's just keep moving here. We tend to be uncomfortable with the blood is the point I'm trying to make here. Verse 15, therefore, because of what we just heard, he's the mediator of a new covenant so that those um, who, uh, who are called may receive the promised inheritance since a death occurred that redeems them from the transgression, transgressions committed under the first covenant. Uh, for where a will is involved, the death of the one um, who made it must be established. For a will takes um, uh, effect only at death, since it is not a force as long as in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. So, uh, making a point again about uh, about Jesus's death, like it was needed. Look, check this out for believing Israel. Um, those were good things for them, like all of the temple things and all of that. It was a short-term deal. The blood of Jesus works retroactively back to believing Israel even before Jesus died. That's what one of the things this is saying, that the blood of Jesus was necessary even for them. Ultimately, at the end of the day, um, the, the blood of those animals was insufficient, um, and that will come up later in this passage. Um, but um, the main point here is that um, the covenant was inaugurated with blood, so there's continuity, there's similarity between old and new covenant. The same principles are there. Something has to die whenever sin is present. Um, and um, that whenever Jesus died, in effect, um, that, that um, whenever he died, that in effect brought the old covenant to a close. Uh, before he even uses the analogy of before a will can be read, well, somebody needs to die, right? Um, before you can say, okay, I bequeath to you this and that. Um, and before all the family members get crazy and start fighting over things and, and all those kind of things, um, that, um, that before all that can happen that, that somebody has to die. And that's what he's saying is that when Jesus died, it was the, the end of the old covenant era and it brought into, um, the, so to speak, his will was as he wrote it and, and gave it to his followers is I, I bequeath you this new era. And there's this new era um, of transformation and, um, and through his cross, through his resurrection, it enabled all these other things we're gonna talk about. Verse 19, 
For when every commandment of the law has been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with scarlet and water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God uh, commanded you for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and the vessels used in worship. So this is ceremonially cleansing it to make them, I mean, not only dealing with sin, but also dealing with ceremonial uncleanness in the Old Testament. Um, and then verse 22. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And listen to this. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So um, again, this is making this point that it's not that the cross just out of thin air and people will make this accusation sometimes of, hey, um, and it was really the heart of the reason for the book of Hebrews is that there's just like an innovation that Jesus died on the cross and whoa, where did that come from? And the author of Hebrews is saying, well, it came from, it's been the same way um, all the time is in the Old Testament, pretty much everything had to be purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's not. I mean, even think Genesis 3, Adam and Eve have sinned and they realize they're naked. And what do they go do? They go kill an animal and um, cover themselves with the, the, I mean, obviously they they knew they were naked and needed to cover themselves, but an animal died when there was sin. And again, I realize there is, this is why we push back against the the blood is they're like, why? Why somebody got to die? And the fact that we ask that question, I'm not criticizing you for asking it because I, I anticipated that because I felt that way before too, is the reason we ask that question to begin with is hear me on this. And this is almost universal in this room. We underestimate the seriousness of sin. We just do. We think it's no big deal. You know, it's like, well, I made a mistake. So I mean, everybody makes mistakes. And, uh, but here, here's, the, here's the reality is that when you see that from the very beginning, the very first sin that's recorded in humanity in Genesis 3, and you see throughout the Old Testament that you've got a provision, like even as the law came through Moses up on that mountain, like immediately along with it came provision for sin. Like it, they were like right there together. Hey, don't do all this stuff and do these things. And by the way, you're gonna do these things and not do these things. And so we're gonna have have to have some kind of atonement, like even if it's temporary, even if it's not the complete thing that will come later. And sin was serious then, but it's so serious now that Jesus had to die on the cross. Like there, um, there had to be a death. Like it's, it's actually really serious business. And I think that we almost all culturally speaking tend to think, eh, you know, no big deal. Um, I'm meant to do right. So that should be enough, you know, but no, it's, it's actually really serious that Jesus had to die in the same way the animals had to die in the old Testament. Verse 23 Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. Um, th- this, this is not new. Um, it, this is like the idea of typology, that um, they were real. You have these heavenly realities of Jesus and the great high priest once for all, like his presence. But you had um, these things that for Israel, for uh, in a temporary basis, were copies of those things, just inferior copies, but real, um, that they needed to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves uh, with better sacrifices uh, than these. So um, this is just really interesting that it's just saying, hey, these were copies, the temple, the sacrifices, all of the feasts of Israel, their copies inferior, but true and real compared to the heavenly versions of these Jesus and his once for all sacrifice and all of that, like this ultimate once and for all forgiveness. And just one last thing I want to say on this before we kind of bring this to a close in the last few verses is that um, I always think it's weird and I see it all the time. It would shock you how much it happens where I see people um, almost like pining away for the things of the old covenant, you know? Like I'll sometimes see, like, I hope that you're curious and interested in the Old Testament and you want to study it and learn it. But sometimes it goes like way beyond that. And I'll see people that'll get like almost like hooked on all of that. And they want to live like an old covenant lifestyle and living in accordance with Old Testament dietary laws. And it's just super interesting when we live in the, those were all shadows that were intended to point Israel um, to the ultimate reality, the heavenly reality, namely Christ. Like all those things were good. They were good for Israel. And they had their purpose for a season, but then they came to an end. And now, if you're a believer in Jesus, you get to live um, uh, in the reality that all of those things pointed to, forgiven. You are purified, and not just externally, but internally, and you're made right with God. And there's been a new birth, and all of those things that had had promised that BG talked about last week, this internal work of God have been accomplished. Like, we live in that reality now. Verse 24, for Christ has entered 
not into the holy places made with hands. This is again, which are copies of the true things um, that in other words, that he, he not, not talking the temple, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. So there's that intermediary function, this great high priest, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters uh, the holy places every year with blood, not his own uh, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But listen to this, but as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of all the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So uh, again, those were good. Those were copies. Um, you had uh, priests offering regularly daily sacrifices and different things to purify. You had the day of atonement. You had all those things. Jesus is a different high priest pointing to the eternal realities. He died one time, once for all. Like that, that answers decisively. Um, when you sense that you are that rose, like he died one time and made you right. He doesn't need to happen again. He doesn't need anything else from you to make you right with him. He died once for all. That worked retroactively for Israel that believed. It works for your past. It works for your present. It even works for your future and for people to come, even your children, um, that that grace will still be present for them as, as they encounter him. Isn't that something? Once for all, love that. Um, and then um, I love, I love those, um, those verses there uh, so much. It appeared once for all at the end of all the ages to put away sin. So it made me ask this question before we look at our last couple of verses. Uh, what are my tendencies then? So it's easy to like talk about Facebook groups and, and people who aren't Christians um, who may have a pushback against the blood of Jesus. And I understand why you do, but uh, maybe today's helped you understand some more of that. But I try to personalize it and think, okay, let's get out of that mode. Me personally, where is it that I tend to have um, when I sin, where is it I tend to go other than going to the blood of Jesus and receiving grace and, and mercy from him? So I came up with uh, four things. That This is me, not projecting on you, but maybe there might be something that you do. One thing I do is sometimes when I sin, the first thing I start to do is go, all right, all right, all right. No, no more of that. It's going to be better. Now it's on. You're going to see. It's almost like I'm like bargaining with him. It's like, I don't want to go to the cross, but I immediately start being like, hey, I, I'll start doing this. And maybe if I start doing this, then you'll overlook that. And you might even help me out with this other thing. But I immediately start promising that I'm going to do better next time. You'll see. Um, second thing is, um, is I sometimes can, um, can um, go to a place of guilt and feel like, no, I, I can't. I need to feel really bad about this for a few days because this was pretty bad. And I'm going to feel really bad and kind of wallow in that, feel sorry for myself for a bit. And then he'll know I'm really serious. And then he'll accept my apology at that point. So sometimes I'll do that. I kind of stay away from him again. I'm still not going to the cross. I want to point that out. Um, I, I'm just feeling bad and almost feeling like my guilt atones for my sin in a way that the cross did not. Um, again, maybe you don't deal with that. Three is excuses about, um, you know, well, you know, first of all, it's not as bad as what they did. Um, or, uh, well, okay, I did it, but God, if you wouldn't have, if you wouldn't have put this person in my life, that's crazy or whatever. You know what I mean? Like we have all these things and that wouldn't you, I'm sure. And, uh, and, if, and if this wouldn't happen, if you wouldn't have put me in this spot, then I wouldn't have to respond that way. You know, I wouldn't yell at you if you didn't act up or whatever, you know, all these things. So I come with excuses again, anything but the cross or just flat out denial um, where um, we're like, well, it wasn't that bad or just where we minimize and no, I didn't. That wasn't what I meant. Um, and do all these things and anything but own it, anything but receive grace, anything but go to the cross. And um, really the invitation today is like, no, actually, actually that's the first place we go is not these things, uh, but he died once for all. Like no more sacrifices need to be done. Like there's no, you don't need to bargain. You don't need to, to um, kind of pose that everything's fine is you're safe. You're actually safe to come to him as a son and a daughter and be like, here's what I've done. And I'm so sorry and you'll find grace. Isn't that amazing? And you, you're already gonna know that there's no life with that and you're not gonna wanna continue in that. But even if you do, even if you do that again, um, there's grace for you, even if there's all sorts of tangible consequences um, here. Let's conclude with the last couple of verses. Verse 27, 28. And just as it has been appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ has been offered once to bear the sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. And I love this. And so this would be a bit of a warning and a challenge. If you're not a Christian, so glad you're here. And maybe you even have thought some of those things about the blood of Jesus before is look, we're going to die once and there's not a bargaining. It is there. You're not going to say anything at all. Like this is the evidence is there. Did you trust Christ or not? 
is all that's going to come down to. Did you believe in Jesus' death and resurrection? Um, but listen, the encouragement is, is Jesus died one time, and he did that to deal decisively with sin. Um, and, and then this is also encouraging. Not only is he going to forgive sin, he's already done that, but um, he's going to come again, except this time not to deal with sin but to restore all things. Isn't that beautiful? That um, he's going to save those who eagerly wait on him and it's all gonna be made right. And so I just wanna encourage you, encourage you on this. Um, minimizing the blood of Jesus, denying it, um, it, it just boils Jesus down to another enlightened teacher. Um, and the, the act like Jesus is actually not good news any more than act like Moses was not good news or act like Abraham is not good news, uh, that none of those things are good news. What is good news is that the son of God laid his life down for us, saved us completely and, and fully through his death and resurrection. It happened one time. You're forgiven. You are the rose that is loved. Uh, you are adored by him. You are clean. You are forgiven and even called to obedience, this time not out of a duty of a treadmill, but rather out of freedom as sons and daughters to walk according to God's design, um, even eagerly awaiting that day whenever um, our faith becomes sight. That's the hope. Let me pray. Lord, would you... Um, would you um, Work this deep in our soul, uh, deep trust in you, deep faith in you, um, that there'd be hope um, and even relief to those that maybe just walking with a heavy load of guilt, maybe feeling like nothing had ever been enough, that your once for all sacrifice would penetrate all of those defenses and that there would be a real sense of your kindness today. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Amen.